Good evening and a warm welcome for our June installment of the 2022 Phosphorescence Poetry Series. Dickinson uses the term phosphorescence to describe a divine spark and illuminating light. We launched this series during the pandemic in celebration of the power of poetry to spark the imagination and ignite transformation. Since then, we have continued to offer virtual readings running monthly now through December, bringing you established and emerging poets from all over the world. My name is Elizabeth Bradley, and I am the Education Programs Manager at the Emily Dickinson Museum. I am thrilled to be with you tonight with two fantastic poets. Since we cannot see your audience, I hope you'll consider sharing words of appreciation on, for our poets in the chat during the readings. And you can start right now by telling us in the chat where you are tuning in from. So I'm joining you this evening from Northampton, Massachusetts. See somebody from Greenfield, Bath, oh, and here they all come, India. Missouri, Texas, Amherst, New Haven, Oklahoma, Australia. And I see so many familiar names too. It's, it really feels like we have a community here. Thank you all. Please note that we have enabled the Zoom auto transcription this evening. The audio transcription generates closed captioning to the best of a computer's ability. So there will be some errors along the way. You can choose to turn this feature on or off by clicking on the live transcript button at the bottom of your Zoom toolbar. Tonight's program is going to last one hour. We'll start with the readings and then end with conversation. We invite you to participate as we go. So be ready to add questions that you have for the poets to the Zoom Q&A feature. And now without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's poets to you. And I'm just adding all of us. Oh, here we're all together now. Um, so we have with me tonight, Stacy Samazic, the author of the books, Emptied of All Ships, Hyperglossia, Heart Island, A Year From Today, and Journal of Ugly Sights and Other Journals, which won the Adeline Prize from Fence Books and was nominated for a Lambda Literary Award. Her books, Famous Hermits and the Pasolini book will be published in 2022, so stay tuned for those. Samazic was the director of the Poetry Project at St. Mark's from, 20, from 2007 to 2018. Since then, she was the Hugo Visiting Writer at the University of Montana, Missoula in 2018-2019, Poet in Residence at Brown University, and Visiting Poet for the Fire Island Artist Residency. She currently lives in the Hudson Valley region of New York. Anna Talomi is a poet, filmmaker, and interdisciplinary artist whose work has been presented at the Library of Congress and the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. She has performed her poetry across the US, including at the El Paso border for Artists Uprising with One Billion Rising. WBIA's Radio Blooms Day featuring Alec Baldwin and Jerry, Jerry Stiller and at the Theo Poetics Conference. Anna has created installations incorporating her poetry for museums and galleries, including the Elena Museum. She has recent poetry in the Ekphrastic Review, Rattle Magazine, Hevria, Fem Power, and Life as Ceremony. And we will be posting links to the works of these poets in the chat tonight as they read. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you, Stacy. Thank you so much for being with us here this evening. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you so much to the Emily Dickinson Museum for um, this uh, really special, amazing invitation. And I'm really, really happy to be here reading with Anna. Um, so I'm gonna read from a, a long poem, a 30 page poem, and I'll probably be able to read the first 10 pages of it. Um, and it has a little bit of a foreword that I condensed for this reading. Um, 
I wrote this poem called Three Novenas Last Summer After Two Events. One, I hit my head. And two, the next day I went to a public performance by the artist Linda Montano. And she did what she called the piano portrait of me, which involved me saying the Hail Mary, the prayer. Then she advised me to keep saying the prayer at home. As a person who was unhappily raised Catholic, I have a complex relationship to prayer. So I took it on and took it into this poem. And there is a passage in this poem actually by um, Emily Dickinson. I think it's number 320 and it, it's immediately recognizable. Um, and I'd like to dedicate this reading of three novenas to uh, women's rights and bodily autonomy for everybody. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. One. Heating pad, cape, towel, white, roll, one-fourth of the eye dropper. Not on my knees and in English sleeping to the announcer's voice, then silence provoked me with terrific vision of my life completely isolated by age and chronic conditions, a film from which I emerged only by playing a word game, res, R-E-Z, for 12 points before I before hit with exhaustion my body at a 100 degree angle. I played with my ascendance in a field, receiver of an inflated animal bladder. Can we describe sound as epic, skyscraping? The thump when it made contact with my middle aqueduct is the injury, it is what it is. Pink Marion studio votive blown out an early birthday wish, embrace risk in Mexico. I flew over the border wall with St. Anselm and saw every living thing maladapting in dove time. Gentle pressure from the hands of the people on my right side, Kimberly's jewel toned dress at my fiddle head. Floors stained plum, knees fizzle, pitched forward the spirit level, bubble out of the guidelines, flurry of white moths who stay outside and slow, black flies feeding on moisture want the inside of my prayer. Two, Hail Mary. Do you have a pillow, maybe in the shape of a tooth, to make the crown fit? He ground down the healthy molar above it. He looked bereft in the parking lot as I drove away. Saint Apollonia, assist me as tissue that isn't living, cannot heal itself. Baby turkey haunt followed their mom across 9G. Thank God it was me and not some psycho. Even in their panic, they moved in perfect synchronicity. What does it mean, loss of a way of life? Do you work here? Can you tell me if you sell? Are you selling hot dogs today? No? Well, say hi to Donnie. That I may always be mistaken for someone who works there. The way one thing serves as other things in a village, Henderson's heating, oil, and gravestones, Lime Street hot dog mechanic. A fly steps into a certain slant of light in my northwest corner oppresses like the heft of cathedral tunes, heavenly hurt it gives us. We can find no scar, but internal difference where the meanings are. And I'll go out for a drink with one of my demons tonight, out being saturated with risk. That part where it says it was against the rules for Mary to bring her lamb to school. And the teacher turns out the lamb who is later executed as a state criminal. I know the freight train makes the house shake and there's something mechanized in the basement. It's not my head, I know. It's absolutely horrible, this prayer to say poetry is, serializing my bends. Pink wax burns away, illuminating you from the neck up. Miami built on limestone, Tucson, 
homeless living in washes during monsoon season, Philadelphia 100 year flood, another piece of energy ignited that severe weather. Please not now. Water, apple, recline, track income to ensure I'm not disqualified. Three, Hail Mary. The life of CB with the death of Christian Boltanski has officially come to an end. I think that we are always telling the same story and that we end up making the same work more or less. Reincarnated, but with memory, reincarnated at a party with a pony, reincarnated talking to a woman who referred to an old bro it she used to know, told me to put on the red lipstick. Guadalupe, if you appeared to me to ask for a temple, I don't know what I'd do. Chestahova embellished in low relief, copper. You bear the scars of saber, slashes, my favorite miracle. Each time they are repaired, you remanifest them. I have to imagine Tindari along the Palermo Messina Highway. That I don't begrudge my dreams, their poets, fullness in the head, relax, dream sleep, deja vu, behind the scenes kindness, when everyday life is a challenge, redefine life. When conditions alter, drastic, have we already perished? Talk myself out of things I think I need, anything I can't eat or read. Biblical drought has people eating ash and shoe leather in Madagascar. Linda was wearing a face mask and printed with your likeness. There were two weeks when we stopped wearing masks. My body tries to tell me so much on a daily basis. Increased healing time, increased collapse time, plastic arts, duck bones on the stove, a fan, a rug. Four, Hail Mary. I didn't clock this as cognitively complex, but I keep forgetting where I go associatively. May that. You are the fern undulating with air, more integrated than birthday wishes, electronic deposits. Surrealism is people you used to know. If you drive by the library and pop your trunk, the librarian will put your books in it. Give me the, be with me, please, praise, Make me think, forgive. You get a little behind, nurse to body. Grace and time to contend with bailing on the hamster wheel, breaking out of the ball, crawling out from behind the stove with seared toes, never to be that idealized again. And they still said you were fat. Vulnerabilities introduce themselves to you in your 20s, allow you to control them, and top you in your 50s. The math, it takes two years to feel a decade. Like at 12, I knew life with breasts would be. At 22, I knew life without money would be. That tomorrow, I won't have to go through this chronic self-telling. My head was impacted, there were witnesses. I bothered, I thank you. You can feel our limitations in the prosody when the prayer is all proem. New York on high alert reports stumbling birds with crusty eyes, bird feeder down, scare owl up. Convinced, to be honest, in a way I only gestured toward with Linda. Five, Hail Mary. I utterly believed Many things disturbed my. The pink dog from my babyhood played Mary had a little lamb, not rockabye baby. Fabricated connection. I hugged the poet. You look great. He was naked and bald, much thinner. We might have all looked like this last night. Your people are naked. We don't remember the destroying storm and the hour of grace, the Grimm's tale waking up in a temperate rainforest, chartreuse, moss, beards, dryness of age countered, harmony of the flora. 
fear obliterates knowledge. All that's left is to keep ourselves outside ordinary time. The books in this room are all still speaking. They said it was still raining. Impossible requests in mid-July. Indulge me, please undo. After a hard day of doing nothing, death to death mongers, bad infrastructure is a paved over earth. Wait until the next moon wobble. For Inner Mongolia, pro province of Rees, Marlborough region, Alpine region, Caracas, Chad, Oman, the states of Arizona, Texas. Six, Hail Mary. We are the point of oscillations between the moon and the tides, a fine line between being banished and banishing myself from all human rooms, the hermit corpus made of two opposing triangles joining to create a star. Let us give up our trips. Your votive light whips out voyage. Upon the wall, you make lucky the person who hears luxury in the ringing of ears. There is a public for poetry but not a world. The midwife had a halo of outgrown purple hair. These new and ephemeral sensations like other onsets, your body is changing every day. I have it on female authority. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, um, Stacy. that was so gorgeous. And I just feel really appreciative and grateful to be sharing space with you tonight. Um, and thank you to the Emily Dickinson Museum. This, we were discussing this right before, but this is such an honor um, and it's, it's just really a gorgeous thing to be involved in. Um, so I'm going to be reading a series of mostly uh, shorter poems. Um, and uh, that are from my first uh, collection that I'm currently putting together. So um, and we'll begin. Blessing for diaspora as a spiritual practice. To be alive is to attend a prayer service, to do the work of the heart in the temple of the world, to build the tender center of that temple inside yourself is a blessing. To seek for that center again and again in everyone, each body a tent for conducting its own ceremony into ascension. To build the altar within you and decide what you will sacrifice and who you will not. To hold all the brokenness for the sake of any chance of repair to welcome everyone exiled, everything broken from its origins and all holiness is ripped from their dwelling places and chant together here, here, here. Uh, this is called Rough Bark um, and it first appeared in Hevria and was written during uh, the pandemic. Rough Bark. This is not a poem about a virus. This is a poem about the sunlight trembling in through the curtains. This is not a poem about dying. This is a poem about the willows shimmying and the time V told me, you'll know you're where you need to be when you can see the trees smile. And I watched and I waited and then I could. This is not a poem about my lungs hurting. This is about roots squishing into the juicy ground. I'm not going to talk about coughing in this verse. This line is not about K on a ventilator. It's about epiphytes, plants that live on other plants but are not parasitic. So this is about orchids growing on avocado trees. This is not about N staggering away from the hospital, calling to tell us there's no medicine for her, that all she can do is go home. This is about how upland orchids do best in partial shade and how avocado trees boast rough bark while suited to root attachment. This is not about Z washing R's body himself before carrying him into the ground. This is about how you must 
water or mist the orchid roots daily. If you want them to attach to the tree, they are so exposed, no longer resting in soil, not yet reoriented. This is not about D laying cuttings from Elle's garden onto his shrouded body. This is not about how when honoring both a person and their privacy, a name becomes unspeakable like God. This is not a poem for the dead. This is a poem for the living. But if the dead want to join in, they are invited. I'm not going to say Kaddish in this one. But if I did, I might remind myself that in the mourner's Kaddish, there is no mention of death. I might remember that with proper care, a land-bound plant separated from the soil can adapt to living in this new way. Um, okay, this is uh, called Hymn to Bloodletting, Sacrifice of Becoming, and it's about bodily autonomy for everyone and reproductive justice. Him to bloodletting, sacrifice of becoming. How did you come to grow ancient and stubborn inside me, catastrophic like the moon? When they call the uterus home of hysteria, believe them. Watch them draw fire against the living of our ruckus, how they come for us, you, Cycloptic, bloodshot, red-eyed with rage. When they hold you accountable for all time and every pleasure and harm, while they take you by force inside your own cave. Watch how they make you a god. How they try to tame you like a beast. Because they don't know how to make a home in either. A holy or the animal of you. So um, the sixth poem is called She'elat Chalom, and it refers to a uh, practice in my ancestral tradition, which is Judaism. Um, it's a mystic practice of understanding your dreams, um, and it's an inquiry into them. So it's called She'elat Chalom. These were the signs of my dreams. The wooden table and the wooden chair, rough hewn from the weathered spiral trunk of a lodgepole pine, three grains of rice, three grains of grace, the voice was saying. The burlap sack in which to carry them, the coarse body that bumpy life, the outrage a hot coal in the chest in which to burn or boil harvested seed, all of it comes down to these, and they are three grains of rice, sustenance, three grains of grace, enough. Wonder. We know the sun doesn't rise anymore or set, and yet we're determined to continue this myth. We gather on beaches like bonfires, some people clap to see that glowing orb go down. Our rituals and traditions, we know. We know the water isn't the end of it all. We know we're not the only planet that exists, that the universe extends past the horizon, that the sun doesn't really sink down into the underworld below us and wake up the next day rallying us to, to begin. We know this. We have known for years. And yet, we remain committed to the celebration of this story, to believe what we also know isn't true. I hope one day they write about us, how confusing we were and charming, how we lived in that liminal space when we had been told that we were turning, 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 around the nearest star, that there was no such thing as a sunrise or a sunset. And knowing this completely, we still chose to believe.
Um, so this is called Geniza. And in Judaism, a Geniza is a storage place. It's an ancient idea. Um, it's a storage place where unusable sacred documents, especially documents that name God, are worn out um, and worn out ritual objects where they're held to keep them safe before they're buried. So it's really a storage place for unusable sacred documents and worn out rituals that um, name God, ritual objects. Geniza. How many times have I cried out God and more polite people would have called it in vain? What of each of us is a Geniza? Tanait Aznat Barzani held the secret name in her mouth and when she opened it, doves flew out of the burning synagogue or was it angels? Angels that looked like doves? And what are angels? Rebbe Lizala, Rebbe Lila, excuse me, Rebbe Libala learned three things in Kutsk. One, we are not angels. Two, we can become greater than angels. And what is the third? I am catching my breath on our tongues. Words have caught fire. Here are the doves. Hallelujah, buried in a Yiddish lullaby. Hi, la, lu, 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 a nigun, a melody for a baby. You must know the words to say them. Praise Yah, praise Yah, praise. Givura, din, strength, judgment. If you believe, you can ruin. Chesed, loving kindness, believe, you can repair. Tiferet, beauty, the gan, in Geniza, the garden, hiding within the storage for the used up. Avraham could see a portal to the garden in the cave. So he buried his beloved there, O oh, Sarah. Did you reproach the first Adam, like the sages say the dying righteous must? Ya, yid hey, chai chet yud, so close to mirror images, God and life, so close, images almost made in each other. I am exhausted of blaming what is ruined in me. Everything is usable. Everything names God and I will keep it safe. Settling up. I wanted beautiful things to hold the earth and wear and smell its coffee beans, your face in the morning, soft before waking, the latest new moon, covert and still loved. I wanted couture too. I wanted god debt hem hemlines with fairy tale endling, frothy tall sleeves, purses and ice blues and cherry reds with gold chains to grasp and swing. I wanted to chase a life in the world that felt a little like a romantic comedy on a movie theater screen. Big and ordinary and out of reach and come home to a life of aging Rembrandt's self-portrait. The sunlight revealing our rumpled faces, our willingness to hold on to the shadows. Uh, this one is about my partner. Vesication. As soon as we step out of our tent on this highway campsite, the woman we met in the parking lot clasps her hands around our faces, pulls us together and tells us, you are the hope. The Jew and the Palestinian. Everyone we meet wants us to be a metaphor. For a while, we use our bodies to stand on stages and say, if we can love each other, so can you. As if peace is made in bedrooms, as if tanks are not the opposite of consent. Here, put your hand here on my heart where no bullets are firing. Open my mouth with your lips where we promise each other. The pain too is a symbol they built into us. Insist that to us it's always been this way as if that you and I are cursed as if by witches and fairy tales to always war 
as if we are that myth, inhabiting archetypes to have a hard go. I ask one night if you are a warlock, you say you might be, say I too carry gifts, encourage us to sing any malicious thoughts out of us with the attributes of the sacred Arabic or Hebrew, it doesn't matter, it's the same root. We move into an apartment and before sleep, you joke, I am colonizing your pillow again. You cite your rights and I recognize the UN resolution 181. I return your pillow. We name the bedroom closet home and the hallway closet exile. And we argue over whose clothes should go where. You leave your clothes on the floor of exile. And some days when you are gone, I sit in there and make a home. It's spacious and quiet. When I take your phone charger without asking, you name it an occupation. If this hole holds a blister, we are popping it. It is not beautiful to let the pus run, but it carries relief. Uh, this is called Bamidbar Los Angeles. Uh, Bamidbar in Hebrew, um, it's a section of Torah and it means literally uh, in the desert uh, or in the wilderness. Bamidbar Los Angeles. I didn't want a priest. I wanted what we all want in the wilderness after losing our home to find a place to wash. I wanted the daybreak's womb of mercy to birth me new and clean, my grubby fingers over the copper basin within the pitcher's pour. If there was a ritual my ancients might have done, I wanted to remember its limbs to my communal body, implant its rhizome throughout my red earth. I wanted to dip my bitter spine in salt water and sing to the sea its name alive. I wanted to know something holy and present could dwell here and adorn her with ornaments, the nose ring, the amulet, the veil, study sacred text with her throughout one night and on another fall asleep and stir like a lion in that alley between the dusk skies, first three stars and the dawn. The roar over our exile from each other Midbar, Midaber, Midaber, Midbar, Mandalit Beit Resh, Mandalit Beit Resh. Wilderness speaks. A speaker is a wilderness. I wanted God. I wanted God. I wanted to know where I came from and at Sadiq to trace the map of my breath and say here. I wanted no bullets in my arsenal, only the most delicious panting offering I could bring and stomach annihilating in fire. I don't know if you can hear the, in the background my dog making noise, but appreciate your welcome of everyone and Zoom performances and readings. Uh, this one is called Binding. My neighbor asks how I'm doing. So I show him the wooden altar I'm building that holds the weight of a person. And he says, whoa, that's some heavy Abraham and Isaac shit. And sure, but not everything weighs that much. I wanted a place for us to sit and consider all we have to offer which doesn't carry the heft of sacrificing your child, but has consequence. I wanted a scripture that whispers, you too are the world and I am the world. There is no other world to repair and the repairing is more of a remembering. I wanted a hymn that sings, we are made in the likeness of each other. We will shape ourselves into the shape of ourselves in this lifetime. I swear. Reckoning. You have to know you're enough. And you have to remember. Then you have to forget. 
and tumble into the soft darkness and let it hold you. Sometimes, if you're lucky, it will whisper to you secrets like, this is happening. You are alive, even if just barely. And when you are on the edge of mercy, in that pillow embrace of that God that you have called pain, you have to let it toss you back into the earthen world and lay you on its ground until you say, I do, I want to be here. And this time, I mean it. Thanks. Thank you um, both of you so much for those incredible words, the offerings of yourselves, and as well as your reflections on the moment that we are in right now. I want to remind all our audience members that you can place uh, Q&A questions for these poets in the Q&A function of this webinar. So I'll kick us off with a question or two, but I would love to be able to bring questions from our audience members to these poets. And there's so much, um, I take a look at the chat, Stacey and Anna, because there is so much love for both of you and, and, your, and your words there. So um, a question to kick us off, just because it is, it is Pride Month and um, you are two queer poets. And I know that, I don't know about you, but I know that I personally have found this to be one of the most challenging Pride Months in the past several years. Um, so I'm curious how you as poets use your verse to navigate the sacred and to find healing and affirmation. And you can sit with that for a moment. You use the word hefty, both of you, which I thought was funny. And then I just threw out something hefty at both of you. Um, but uh, yeah. Um, I guess the first thing that comes to mind is that I don't, I mean, I feel like navigate, I'm just kind of like fixated on the word navigate. And it's like, it feels like so much work to like constantly navigate, navigate, navigate. So I was, I don't want to navigate the sacred. <laughs> so I feel like <laughs> that's not like, an <laughs> another thing I have to do. Um, but yeah, I feel like the same, you know, I, 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 as a poet, try to, you know, I believe and through my experience and cultivating it too, that, um, there is sacredness in the everyday. Um, and so I, I don't wanna navigate it so much as kind of be subject to it. You know, and that's one, I don't, I don't mind that kind of coming and acting upon me. <laughs> and in that way, I guess it is healing, you know, because it's like these forces uh, can make us feel like we don't have any control, um, but it is grounding to feel like um, you are, uh, with something mysterious and you have language, you know, um, to explore that feeling of not knowingness. Um, I, I was just gonna say that, that that does get me through difficulty. Um, I think I, I love everything you said, Stacey, and um, would echo that. I, I love that idea of when poets talk, even that idea of like every word matters, that even like, are we navigating? Are we not, do we not want to even navigate um, the, the, the potential to navigate and the choice not to? Um, I think a lot of my poems originally, some, a lot, not all of them, but, but many of my poems started out, like have began out of these seedlings of wrestling with something, of struggling with something and, and answering it to myself, you know, sort of like um, 
playing with the idea of if the answer isn't in that the answer isn't out there right we've all been through something where we've we've struggled and you've asked everybody and it doesn't really make a difference um and so the idea that that we have it in ourselves um to answer what we're struggling with um or to heal through our own language and our own interaction with language i think itself is very healing to remember that the to experience that the words we have available to us or the thought process we have available to us or the connection or relationship we have with ourselves um, is, is available and is in of itself sacred and, and that that is a sacred practice to reconnect um, with our own knowing. I, I myself was muted there. Um, the, I see echoes in the, in the chat, the audience being excited about the idea of, of the sacredness of every day. And I think that also recalls a lot of Dickinson for me. Um, people may say that Dickinson wrote a lot about death, but she finds this incredible power in the act of living and of cherishing the fabric of daily life. And she wrote a poem that begins, to be alive is power, existence in itself without a further function, omnipotence enough. And I thought about that poem when you began your reading, Anna, with to be alive is to, to attend a prayer service. And then Stacy, you were offering novenas interwoven with reflections on daily life. And I'm curious to know where each of you find the poetry of daily life? What's inspiring to you? How do you make time to bring those moments back to your writing? Um, I think, you know, uh, work, you know, as a person who has a job and, you know, as most, most poets have a job. Um, and so uh, I kind of discovered living in New York City years ago that one way to kind of make time for my writing was to write about my job. And so I wrote a lot about, um, you know, the kind of like the poetics of administration. <laughs> Um, you know, ad admin jobs, you know, who knew they could be so chock full of poetic inspiration, <laughs> but I, you know, I, I did it. I made it happen. Um, I found it. Um, every, anything, anything like plants, food, um, my conversations with my partner, um, but I'm very, uh, inspired by, my, my own sense of lineage and the books that I read. And I quote heavily from other poets all the time. Um, I feel like, you know, I feel like I'm a part of that and I feel like they're, they're there for me to dip in. So, you know, there is that whole passage from Emily Dickinson in this poem that I read. Um, so she's in there. Um, animals. I'm writing a poem about snakes right now. <laughs> um, first off, I love I love the question Elizabeth you're asking about just drawing parallels to, to ways that Emily Dickinson might have influenced us. And um, what I have found before, like ever since this, ever since I knew we were doing this, and I think you even posed the question, you know, we might talk about you know, the relationship to your work to Emily Dickinson. And I just like finding it everywhere. Like we, like how much I wasn't even aware how, like I know I love her work and I know she, her work influences so much of not only my writing, but you know, how I approach life. But, but I think it's become so interwoven and I've been such a fan of her since I was, you know, a kid that was one of like the first, I just remember as a kid, reading Dickinson and be like, what is this? You know, like, I'm not entirely sure what this is and it's not simple as everything else and I need to know what it is. Um, and that investigation, um, I think finds its way into work 
sometimes consciously, sometimes unconsciously. I've been surprised to like pull out like, oh wait, wait, wait um, and see where that happened. Um, I think as far as finding time process to write, um, I've been exploring something new recently. I think for a lot of my, a lot of my life, I've, I've had this idea of like, either of setting time aside to write and that seems really good because you know, there's structure can be really helpful. Um, but then getting really frustrated if I get interrupted or if I can't actually have that time or if I have to do something else. Um, or this sort of uh, idealized idea of, you know, you get this beautiful thought and you run to write it down. But then if somebody interrupts you, like I've gotten very annoyed and frustrated. And I find that's not exactly like a sacred or poetic way to live. So um, something I'm more curious about now is kind of being in the flow of creative creativity in the flow of poetry and the flow of you know creation energy so that it's not it's not so like tight it's not so you know I'm not worried about get, if, it, if I don't have time right now I'll have time later I can write something down real quick or I can remember it in my head throughout the day um, and let it build and blossom and grow into something else or maybe that thing I thought was really great isn't by the end of the day you know um, so just having more fluidity and more fun with it um, has been really helpful to not being so worried about making the time um, and just letting letting words happen. I love that, um, to letting words happen. Also, Stacey, I really hope you write a book now called The Poetics of Administration. I think so many people would want to read it. Um, so I'm getting some great questions in the Q&A and I want to ask you all of these questions, uh, but I'll start with this one. How does your sense of place influence your poetry? Um, enormously. I mean, I'd say living in New York City. I think it didn't, my first two books didn't deal with place at all. And then I moved to New York City and I think New York City, for me, one of the things that did immediately was make me write about New York City. <laughs> so it's like, um, I don't know if that happens to everyone, probably not. Um, but yeah, so it's like my three New York City books are clearly could not have been written anywhere else and are clearly um, me it, uh, being a pedestrian in that city. Um, and I did write a book um, that is uh, heavily about my life as a poetic poetry administrator at the Poetry Project. It's called A Year From Today. I probably will never go back. So that's whatever I'm gonna say about poetry and administration is in a year from today. <laughs> um, yeah, and now, you know, I, I'm fairly recent to the Hudson Valley and um, this Three Novenas is the first poem I wrote um, here. And there's, it's not very overt, but there's pieces. I mean, it was like last summer, it just rained every day um, in the afternoon. And so there, there is that kind of concern, like lushness or almost like a, a, f a lush phobia. It was like almost too lush, you know? <laughs> it's like moss and fungus and grass and overgrowth and bugs and, um, yeah, so I think, you know, I'm still getting to know um, my place here. So it's, con it's, a, it's continuing like my exploration, but yeah, it's very, wherever I am is very important because I'm paying attention to my surroundings and my place and the, the, the everyday and where, wherever I'm living my days. Uh, you know, when I was living in the desert, the desert is in, in that book, the desert book, you know, so it's like central. Um, I think for me, places, I think the, the dis attachment to place, the, the I can't say it's a detachment because it's not, it's like a longing to be connected to place, but I, I've, I've traveled a lot of different places. I've moved a lot, um, more specifically, I've, I've moved a lot and, um, like for better or worse, I come from a tradition that is sort of like obsessed with, uh, diaspora obsessed with kind of like where is place and either you're either there's a place you want to go to or you're pro being without a place so 
um, it, it kind of has informed, it's a lot, it's just been a lot of what I've come from and it's informed a lot of um, understanding that I have a choice whether or not to engage with that, um, but that it engages with me often. Um, and as somebody who just travels a lot um, and both travels a lot for work and moves a lot, um, I think for a while, I just, I often throughout my life has had this idea of like, where is home and where is, what is, and, and that relationship to, you know, where is home and wanting that informs a lot of my work, but, but also on the flip side, finding home inside myself, I think is an integral part to my work and to the work, to the way that I write and to what I write about. Um, and seeing the home inside everyone, you know, and seeing all the places we come from physically, but also all the ourselves as sacred space, you know, ourselves as a sacred place and a sacred space and each of us holding um, an altar, having an altar inside of us. And I think when I write about that, I think in the first poem, you know, it's a metaphor, but it's also, I sort of mean it. <laughs> that's, that's is my interest in how to approach life. Um, so, so I'm deeply interested in placemaking inside myself and inside ourselves and honoring the placemaking we're each, we're each doing individually and as a collective. Thank you for that. I think it's really striking too, the way that place, you know, can be made or, or defined through poems. I think about that a lot working at the Emily Dickinson Museum as, as somebody who takes the name of Amherst and in the way that she signs her poems or is thinking so distinctly about what it means to see um, New england -ly. I'm gonna to return to our first question um, in the, in the Q&A and you have spoken about this in different ways, um, but Brooke asks that you both shared poems tonight that came from your respective religious backgrounds. What is it like to write from that place and has that been a formative part of your poetic practice? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, I went to Catholic grade school and um, I was, I mean, you know, there's something, um, there's, you know, it wasn't, it was a negative experience, but I was able to take from it things that would serve me well as a poet. And so I'm interested, you know, like ritual routines, repetition. Um, there's a sensualness like smells, um, incense, um, cost, you know, costumes. <laughs> I was an altar boy. <laughs> Somehow, you know, it was like progressive enough where I got to be an altar boy. Um, so I liked, you know, I liked holding the book for the priest um you know and then i ended up working in an episcopalian church for 13 years or yeah 13 years um but yeah that kind of call that sense of calling you know it's like if you know if um maybe i think if i'd been i've heard people say this and i i'm like i'm one of those people it's just like oh like i could have maybe been a nun if things were just like slightly different <laughs> um but yeah, I mean, I kind of, I kind of come to poetry as, uh, you know, that with that same sense of like, I'm called, you know, a calling, I'm called to it. I have um, no, it's, it's central to my life. It, it's my life. Cheers from one ex-altar boy to another. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think right now I've sort of made a choice. I've always been interested in spiritual and sacred and, and sacred text. I made a choice to kind of drill down into specific texts of my ancestral tradition um, and spend time on that. And so that's in this book, um, a large part of it um, is getting under it, you know, understanding it, um, getting under it and getting in it and um, 
pulling it apart and and um, deconstructing it, and, you know. So I think that's been really, that's actually been really healing for me. I really wanted to be part of my tradition growing up and I, my family for a lot of different reasons wasn't really that connected to it. Um, and my grandmother was a big part of my life, was more so and she taught me some prayers and she taught me some things, but, um, and she taught me some rituals that were really impactful for me. Um, but it was really important to me to like have more of a connection to that path and to understand it. And as a lover of text, you know, sacred text has been a really juicy place to get in. Um, and uh, and it, it, it sort of informs my poetry, I think a lot. Um, yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you both for sharing your words with us. And this evening, that was an incredible reading and a lot of fun to speak